time for Atomic Julie's Galactic Bedtime Stories. Classic era public domain sci-fi stories from Project Gutenberg. Enjoy. Rhea's Foundling by Algis Budris. Narrated by Julie Hoverson. As originally published in Science Fiction Stories, 1953, and found on Project Gutenberg. The loft of the feed house, with its stacked grain sacks, was a B-72, a fort, a foxhole, any number of things, depending on Fildy's moods. Today, it was a jumping-off place. Fildy slipped out of his dormitory and ran across the yard to the feed house. He dropped the big wooden latch behind him and climbed up the ladder to the loft, depending on the slight strength of his young arms more than on his legs, which had to be lifted to straining heights before they could negotiate the man-sized rungs. He reached the loft and stood panting, looking out over the farm through the loft door at the light wooden fences around it and the circling antenna of the radar tower. Usually he spent at least a little time each day crouched behind the grain sacks and being bigger and older, firing coolly and accurately into charging companies of burly, thick-lipped UES soldiers or going over on one wing and whistling down on a flight of TT-34s that scattered like frightened ducks before the fiery sleet of his wing rockets. But today was different. Today there was something he wanted to try. He stood up on his toes and searched. He felt the touch of Miss Cowan's mind, no different from that of anyone else, flat, unsystematic. He sighed. Perhaps somewhere there was someone else like himself. For a moment, the fright of loneliness invaded him, but then faded. He took a last look at the farm, then moved away from the open door, letting his mind slip into another way of thinking. His chubby features twisted into a scowl of concentration as he visualized reality. The scowl became a deeper grimace as he negated that reality, step by step, and substituted another. F is for Fildy, O is for Out, R is for Ryman, T is for Topology, H is for Heartsick Hunger. Abruptly, the Ryman fold became a concrete visualization, as though printed clearly in and around the air, which was simultaneously both around him and not around him, which existed, not existed, in space-time, he saw the side-slip diagram. He twisted. Spring had come to Rhea's world, spring and the thousand sounds of it. The melted snow in the mountaintops ran down in traceries of leaping water, and the spring crests raced along the creeks into the rivers. The riverbank grasses sprang into life, the plains turned green again. Rhea made her way up the path across the hills, conscious of her shame. The green plain below her was dotted, two by two, with the figures of her people. It was spring and time. Only she was alone. There was a special significance in the fact that she was here on this path in this season. The plains on, on either side of the Brown River were her people's territory. During the summer, the couples ranged over the grass until the dams were ready to drop their calves. Then it became the bull's duty to forage for their entire families until the youngsters were able to travel south to the winter range. Through the space of years, the people had increased in numbers, the pressure of the steady growth making itself felt as the yearlings filled out on the winter range. It had become usual, as the slow drift northward was made toward the end of winter, for some of the people to split away from the main body and range beyond the grey mountains that marked the western limits of the old territories. Since these wanderers were usually the most willful and headstrong, they were regarded as quasi-outcasts by the more settled people of the old range. But, and here Rhea felt the shame pierce more strongly than ever, they had their uses, occasionally. Preoccupied in her shame, she involuntarily turned her head downward, anxious that none of the people be staring derisively upward at the shaggy brown hump of fur that was she toiling up the path. She was not the first, but that was meaningless. That other female people had been ugly or old, that the same unforgotten force that urged her up the mountain path had brought others here before her, meant only that she was incapable of accepting the verdict of the years that had thinned her pelt, 
dimmed her eyes and broken the smooth rhythm of her gait. In short, it meant that Rhea Sayer, grand dam times over, spurned by every male on the old range, was willing to cross the Grey Mountains and risk death from the resentful wild dams for the thin hope that there was a male among the wildlings who would sire her calf. She turned her head back to the path and hurried on, cringing in inward self-reproach at her speed. Except for her age, Rhea presented a perfect average of her people. She stood two yards high and two wide at the shoulders, a yard at the haunches, and measured three and a half yards from her muzzle to the rudimentary tail. Her legs were short and stumpy, cloven-hooved, her massive head hung slightly lower than her shoulders, and could be lowered to within an inch or two of the ground. She was herbivorous, ruminant, and mammalian. Moreover, she had intelligence, not of a very high order, but adequate for her needs. From a terrestrial point of view, none of this was remarkable. Many years of evolution had gone into her fashioning, more years for her one species than for all the varieties of man that have ever been. Nevertheless, she did have some remarkable attributes. It was one of these attributes that now enabled her to sense what happened on the path ahead of her. She stopped still, only her long fur moving in the breeze. Fildy! Five, toe-headed, round-faced, chubby, dressed in a slightly grubby corduroy oversuit and precocious, had his attributes too. Grubby and tousled, branded with a thread of licorice from one corner of his mouth to his chin, involved in the loss of his first milk tooth as he was. He nevertheless slipped onto the path on Rhea's world, the highest product of terrestrial evolution. Alice followed a white rabbit down a hole, Phil D. followed Ryman down into a hole that at the same time followed him, and emerged... where? Phil D. didn't know. He could have performed the calculation necessary to the task almost instantly, but he was five. It was too much trouble. He looked up and saw a gray slope of rock vaulting above him. He looked down and saw it fall away toward a plain on which were scattered pairs of foraging animals. He felt a warm breeze, smelled it, saw it blow dust along the path, and saw Rhea. B is for brown beast. L is for looming large, looking lonely. B, L, bull? No, bison. 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 Noun, the buffalo of the North American plains. Fildy shook his head and scowled. No, not bison either. What then? He probed. Rhea took a step forward. The sight of a living organism other than a person was completely unfamiliar to her. Nevertheless, anything that small and undeniably covered, in most areas at least, with some kind of fur, could not logically be anything but a strange kind of calf. But she stopped and raised her head. If a calf, then where was the call? Fildy's probe swept past the laboring mind directly into her telepathic instinctual centers. Voiceless, with their environment so favorable that it had never been necessary for them to develop prehensile limbs, female people had nevertheless evolved a method of childcare commensurate with their comparatively higher intelligence. Soft as tender fingers, gentle as the human hand that smooths the awry hair back from the young forehead, Rhea's mental caress enfolded Fildy. Fildy recoiled. The feeling was warm. Not candy in the mouth. Soft. Sweet. Candy in the mouth. Familiar. Good. Tasty. Nice. The feeling was not familiar. Not good. Not tasty. Not nice. Why? M is for many motionless months. T is for tense temper tantrums. R is for rabid. No, rapid. Rolling wrench. MTR. Mother. Fildy's mother wanted Fildy's father. Fildy's mother wanted green grass and apple trees, tight skirts and fur jackets on Fifth Avenue, men to turn and look, a little room where nobody could see her. Fildy's mother had radiation burns. Fildy's mother was dead. He wavered, physically. Maintaining his position in this world was a process that demanded constant attention from the segment of his mind devoted to it. For a moment, even that small group of brain cells almost became involved in his reaction. It was that which snapped him back into functioning logically. MTR was mother. Mother was 
tall. In heaven's name, doctor. Thin. When will this thing be over? White. Biped. Biel was Rhea. Rhea was big brown beast, looming large, looking lonely. Biel equals MTR equation not meaningful, not valid. Almost resolved, only a few traces of the initial conflict remained. Phil D. put the tips of his right fingers to his mouth. He dug his toe into the ground, gouged a semicircular furrow, and smoothed it over with his sole. Rhea continued to look at him from where she was standing, two or three feet away. Haltingly, she reached out her mind again, hesitating not because of fear of another such reaction on Phil D.'s part, for that had been far beyond her capacity to understand, but because even the slightest rebuff on the part of a child to a gesture as instinctive as a terrestrial mother's caress was something that none of the people had ever encountered before. While her left-behind intellectual capacity still struggled to reconcile the feel of childhood with a visual image of complete unfamiliarity, the warm mind caress went gently forth again. Phil D. made up his mind. Ordinarily, he was immune to the small emotional problems that beclouded less rational intellects. He was unused to functioning in other than a cause-effect universe. Mothers were usually, though sometimes not, matronly women who spent the greater part of roughly 20 years per child in conscious preoccupation with, and or subconscious or conscious rejection of, their offspring. In his special case, mother was a warm place, a frantic hysteric voice, the pressure of the spasmodically contractile musculature linked to her hyperthyroid metabolism. Mother was a thing from before birth. Rhea, Rhea bore a strong resemblance to an intelligent cow. In any physiological sense, she could be no more his mother than... The second caress found him not unaccustomed to it. It enfolded his consciousness, tenderly, protectingly, empathetic. Fildy gave way to instinct. The fur along the ridge of Rhea's spine prickled with a well-remembered happiness as she felt the hesitant answering surge in Fildy's mind. Moving surely forward, she nuzzled his face. Fildy grinned. He ran his fingers through the thick fur at the base of her short neck. Big warm ball of brown fur. Cool, happy nose. Happy, happy, happy eyes. Great joy welled up in Rhea. No shameful trot across the mountains faced her now. No hesitant approach to the huddled, suspicious wildlings was before her. The danger of sharp female hooves to be avoided, of skulking at the edge of the herd in hope of an anxious male, was a thing no longer to be half fearfully approached. With a nudge of her head, she directed Phil D. down the path to the old range, while she herself turned around. She stood motionless for a sweeping scan of the plain below her. The couples were scattered over the grass, but couples only, the females as yet unfulfilled. This, too, was another joy to add to the greatest of all. So many things about her calf were incomprehensible. The only dimly felt overtones of projected symbology that accompanied Fildy's emotional reactions. The alien structure, so many, many things. Her mind floundered vainly through the complex data. But all that was nothing. What did it matter? The time had been, and for another season she was a dam. Fildy walked beside her down the path, one fist wrapped in the fur of her flank, short legs windmilling. They reached the plain, and Rhea struck out across it toward the greatest concentration of people, her head proudly raised. She stopped once and deliberately cropped a mouthful of grass with unconcern, but resumed her pace immediately thereafter. With the same unconcern, she nudged Fildy into the center of the group of people, and ignoring them, began teaching her calf to feed. Eat. Picture of Fildy, calf, on all fours, cropping the plain's grass. Fildy stared at her in puzzlement. Grass was not food, he sent the data emphatically. Rhea felt the tenuous discontent. She replied with tender understanding. Sometimes the calf was hesitant. Eat. Gently, understandingly, but firmly, repetition of picture. She bent her head and pushed him carefully over, then held his head down with a gentle pressure of her muzzle. Eat. Eat. Phil D. squirmed. 
He slipped out from under her nose and regained his feet. He looked at the other people who were staring in puzzlement at Rhea and himself. He felt himself pushed forward again. Eat? Abruptly, he realized the situation. In the culture of herbivores, what food could there be but herbiage? There would be milk in time, but not for, he probed, months. In probing, too, he found the visualization of his life with her, ready at the surface of Rhea's mind. There was no shelter on the plane. His fur was all the shelter necessary. But I don't have any fur. In the fall, they would move to the southern range. Walk a thousand miles? He would grow big and strong. In a year, he would be a sire himself. His reaction was simple and practiced. He adjusted his reality concept to Riemannian topology. Not actually, but subjectively, he felt himself beginning to slip earthward. Rhea stiffened in alarm. The calf was straying. The knowledge was relayed from her mother centers to the telepathic functions. Stop! You cannot go there! You must be with your mother! You are not grown! Stop! Stay with me! I will protect you! I love you! The universe shuddered. Fildy adjusted frantically. Cutting through the delicately maintained reality concept was a scrambling, jamming frequency of thought. In terror, he flung himself backward into Rhea's world. Standing completely still, he probed frantically into Rhea's mind and found her mind only fumblingly beginning to intellectualize the simple formulization of what her instinctive centers had computed, systematized, and activated before her conscious mind had even begun to doubt that everything was well. His mind accepted the data and computed. Handless and voiceless, not so fast afoot in their bulkiness as the weakest month-old calf, the people had long ago evolved the restraints necessary for rearing their children. If the calf romped and ran, his mother ran beside him, and the calf was not permitted to run faster than she. If a calf strayed from its sleeping mother, it strayed only so far, and then the mother woke. But the calf had already long been held back by the time her intelligence awoke to the straying. The knowledge and computations were fed in Philly's rational centers. The universe and Earth were closed to him. He must remain here. But human children could not survive in this environment. He had to find a solution instantly. He clenched his fists, feeling his arm muscles quiver. His lower lip was pulled into his mouth and his teeth sank in. The diagram, the pattern, bigger, stronger, try, try, this is not real. This is real. Brown earth, white clouds, blue sky, try. Mouthful of warm salt. F is for Fildy, O is for out, R is for Rhea, T is for topology. H is for happiness and home. Rhea shook herself. She stood in the furrows of a plowed field, her eyes vacant with bewilderment. She stared uncomprehendingly at the walls and the radar tower, the concrete shoulders of the air raid bunkers. She saw anti-aircraft quick-firers being hastily cranked around and down at her, heard Fildy's shout that saved her life, and understood none of it. But none of it mattered. Her strange calf was with her, standing beside her with fingers locked in her fur, and she could feel the warm response in his mind as she touched him with her caress again. She saw the other little calves erupting out of the low dormitory buildings, and something within her crooned. Rhea nuzzled her foundling. She looked about her at the war orphan's relocation farm with her happy, happy eyes. That was Rhea's Foundling by Algis Budras, read by Julie Hoverson, as originally published in Science Fiction Stories 1953 and found on Project Gutenberg. Music for this episode was from Incompetech.com. The opening and closing music is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. No claim is made to the underlying story. Copyright of this reading is to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions, 2013, and it is released under a Creative Commons non-attribution share-alike 
non-commercial license. Contact us at www.19nocturneboulevard.com for other productions from Reality Productions and Julie Hoverson.